Ireland. Mid-teens more likely for parts of England and Wales, although in some sheltered spots a fresh start to Saturday. A bright start for the Midlands, East Anglia and the South East. We keep these sunny spells here into the afternoon. Otherwise a lot of cloud and heavy rain moving through Scotland and Northern Ireland, pushing into parts of Northern England, turning more showery. And it's a breezy day for many. That uh, wind gusty around the showers that will be coming through across northern parts of the UK and one or two showers will pop up further south as well. But these will be few and far between. The heaviest downpours will be associated with a line of rain pushing into North Wales and northern England as well as the North Midlands by evening. Scattered showers again on Sunday with more prolonged rain coming through later. Another showery day on Monday. There's just two weeks left of voting in the battle to become Britain's next Prime Minister. Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak have been dashing around the country. And tonight, they make their pitches to Conservative voters in the heart of Labour-run Manchester. But do either of them have what it takes to defend and maintain Boris Johnson's mighty majority? GB News is proud to be hosting the Conservative hustings in Manchester live and exclusive from 7pm. GB News, the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7pm for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panellists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. And welcome to Friday's edition of On The Money, where we're focused on the UK's cost of living crisis, helping you to beat the squeeze. I'm Liam Halligan, and for the next hour, we'll be talking about soaring gas prices this autumn as the Russian energy giant Gazprom warns European wholesale gas could go up by another 60%. I'll be asking, could another big energy exporter, Norway, friendly, democratic, step up to the plate? by selling gas to Western Europe more cheaply than the soaring market price. It's a strange idea, but it's doing the rounds among diplomats and energy bosses, and we'll be exploring it on The Money after the GB News headlines with Bethany Elsie. Liam, thank you. Good afternoon. It's two minutes past one. I am Bethany Elsie, here to bring you up to date from the GB Newsroom. NHS leaders are warning the UK faces a humanitarian crisis this winter unless further action is taken to tackle rising energy bills. In a letter to the government, the NHS Confederation says people will have to choose between skipping meals to heat their homes or living in cold, damp conditions. It warns this could lead to an increase in annual deaths and create further pressure on the 
Health Service. The government has promised £400 of support for millions of households, but won't do anything further until the new Prime Minister is in office. Commuters in London are facing travel disruption today as public transport workers strike in a long-running dispute over jobs and pensions. The advice is to avoid the tube, which will have little or no services running. Most buses across West and South West London are also cancelled. Mainline services across the UK have been affected too due to yesterday's strike and there's further action planned for tomorrow. Transport Secretary Grant Chaps claims union bosses are getting in the way of a deal. I think the simple answer to this would be for the union bosses to actually put the deal that's on the table, which is an 8% pay rise over two years, uh, no compulsory redundancies, for example, on network rail, and put that to their membership. And I think if they did that, the membership may well accept it. If that doesn't happen, plan B, if you like, is we're going to make sure that we uh, actually get on with these very, very important modernisations, which are holding our railway back. Well, Labour's Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, says it's the government that's hindering negotiations. What I'd say to the RMT is uh, the primary motivator for you going on strike today is your concerns about conditions the government may attach to a funding deal with a TfL. We're on the same side here. Nobody wants the government to be attaching unreasonable conditions to our uh, deal. The only reason we need a deal is because of the pandemic. Let's work together with businesses, with other Londoners, to get the best possible deal for uh, London. Today, it's ordinary Londoners, it's commuters, it's businesses who are caught in the crossfire. The government, uh, Grant Sharps, isn't affected at all. UK retail sales increased in July, but experts say a downward trend in consumer spending shows no sign of turning around. The Office for National Statistics says the 0.3% rise is significantly higher than the expectations of a 0.2% drop, but sales fell by 1.2% in the three months prior. Meanwhile, the government has borrowed more money than expected, with interest payments on debt rising by more than 40% last month. The ONS says government borrowing hit £4.9 billion in July. That's more than £2 billion higher than predicted, putting pressure on the funds available to the government to support households with the rising cost of living. A 44-year-old man has appeared at Wilsdon Magistrates Court, charged with the murder of 87-year-old Thomas O'Halloran. Lee Byer is accused of stabbing Mr O'Halloran to death while he was riding his mobility scooter in the town of Greenford on Tuesday. He was pronounced dead at the scene. Mr Byer was remanded in custody and will appear at the Old Bailey later this month. A man has been arrested following the abduction and sexual assault of a six-year-old girl in Greater Manchester. The 23-year-old remains in custody for questioning. Police say the girl was attacked in Droylsden on Wednesday. She's now back with her family. And a man who killed his wife on their wedding night and put her body into a suitcase has been given a life sentence with a minimum term of 21 years. Thomas Nutt killed his partner, Dawn Walker, and dumped the suitcase in bushes behind their home near Halifax in West Yorkshire last year. Miss Walker's body was found four days later. Extremely hot and dry conditions in Europe are causing wildfires to sweep across parts of the continent. In Spain, more than 400 firefighters and 36 aircraft are tackling a blaze in Valencia, which has ravaged 19,000 hectares. The fire has been burning for days. It was dampened by rain on Wednesday, but raged again overnight by strong winds. Over a 1,000 people have been forced to evacuate their homes. And self-driving, fully autonomous vehicles could be on UK motorways in the next three years. The Department for Transport says £100 million is being invested into the scheme, along with new legislation. The government claims the self-driving industry could create up to 38,000 jobs and make roads safer. This is GB News. We bring you more news as it happens. Now let's return to Liam. Coming up on The Money today, gas prices are set to soar on European markets this autumn, says Russian state monolith Gazprom, not least due to sanctions and the Kremlin restricting Western supplies. As prices keep rising, there are calls for another gas exporter, Norway, to sell energy to Western Europe at below market prices to help counter Russia's leverage. Could it happen? Could Norway help solve Europe's energy crisis? We hold a detailed discussion. Plus, 
Hundreds of thousands of students got across the UK got their A-level results yesterday, with many hoping to go to university. But the rising cost of living, and with student debt through the roof, means many of them are thinking about whether or not it's worth it. We continue our discussion. Is a degree worth the financial candle? Yesterday and tomorrow it's a national train strike. Today it's a tube strike. Over three million people use the under London Underground daily. Today, the unions have brought parts of the capital to a standstill. Plus, we report from Felixstowe, one of the UK's biggest ports, where there's more industrial action, once again overpay, doing nothing to ease those supply chain snarl-ups, impacting thousands of British businesses. And as ever, I want your questions, opinions, ideas. What do you think of the issues raised in today's On The Money? And how do they impact you? Email me, gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet at gbnews. I'll read out some of your messages later in the show, so stay with us. This is GB News. I'm Liam Halligan, and you're on the money. Now, European wholesale natural gas prices hit a record high of around £284 per megawatt hour earlier this summer. They've since fallen back to around £190, but that's still five times higher than a year ago. And prices are likely to creep up more as the nights draw in and winter approaches. And ominously, Russian energy giant Gazprom, which supplies Western Europe with around a third of our natural gas, is now warning the cost of that gas could surge by another 60% this winter. Ouch. As the war in Ukraine drags on, the economic conflict between Russia and the West shows few signs of easing. Business leaders in Russia are now resigned to what they call forever sanctions. The idea trade between West and Russia could remain politically restricted for years to come. The mighty Gazprom, the state-dominated monolith, which controls almost a third of the world's known gas reserves, has already cut gas flows to Western Europe via the Nord Stream pipeline between Germany and Russia. Ukraine's also shut one of Gazprom's major transit routes in a bid to starve the Kremlin of cash. In this ghastly gas crisis, there is one bright spot. Norway. Our Scandinavian neighbour isn't only a cross-country skiing powerhouse and birthplace of Ibsen, Grieg and the occasional Premier League striker, it's also a major gas exporter. And over recent months, as economic conflict with Russia has raged, it's been good old Norway, democratic, friendly, reliable, that's helped keep the lights on in Europe, maximising gas production to try and replace deliberately restricted supplies from Russia. But as gas prices have soared, there are rumblings among diplomats and the energy industry Norway should do more, cutting the price at which it sells gas to Western Europe. One of the world's richest nations, Norway, with its massive sovereign wealth fund after years of energy exports, is making a huge windfall from these sky-high gas prices. Back in May, the Norwegian government estimated oil and gas revenues would be equivalent to £85 billion this year alone. This is a country of 5.4 million people. So that, so that amounts to, wait for it, no less than £15,000 per head pouring into Norway's coffers just from oil and gas sold this year. That's more than total UK government spending per head in a whole year. Now, some would say Norway's famously neutral, so why should it sell its gas cheap to help Western Europe stand up to Russia? But is it really in Norway's interests to see countries like Britain, France and Germany fall into recession or to have an emboldened Russia, a country with which Norway shares a border, getting even more leverage over the West. Norway's now supplying around a quarter of Western Europe's gas and a massive 40% of UK gas. Could the country's state-owned energy industry be persuaded to give us energy on the cheap? So that's our on-the-money question today, an unusual one, but it's almost the weekend, so here we go. Can Norway help solve Europe's energy crisis? This is a grown-up discussion, an important discussion, as ever here on The Money, with people who really know their stuff. I'm joined by Natasha Fielding. She's head of European gas at Argos Media, the major energy information agency. Ben Harris, editor-in-chief at Business New Europe in Telenews, a long-term watcher of Russia and its relations with Western Europe. Charles McAllister, policy manager at UK Onshore Oil & Gas. And Paul Cedric returns to On The Money, joining me in the studio, director of Frank Investments 
That's an investment management company. Great to have all of you with us. Let's start with you, Natasha. I've been hearing these rumblings in the oil industry and, and from some diplomats. Is it an entirely crazy idea? I mean, Norway could sell gas at below market prices if it wanted to, right? Um, I would say that, of course, um, it's not an impossibility, uh, but um, under contractual obligations, Norway has um, no reason to change the, the price um, at which it, it, it sells gas to Europe. Um, and until, until we hear from um, the Norwegian government otherwise, I would say it's a very uh, slim possibility that um, Norway would slash the, cut, the price of its gas. I, I agree with you. We've heard nothing from the Norwegian government. What we all know, though, is that Norwegian gas is becoming increasingly important, not least the gas sent from that huge undersea pipeline from Norway to the east coast of England, the, the, the Langeland pipeline. Ben Aris, let's talk about Norway's relations with Russia. You're, you're an old Russia hand. BNE Intelenews focuses on Russia, the former Soviet Union, Central and Eastern Europe and Central Asia. This is, you think about geopolitics a lot. There could be some benefits to Norway from doing this, right? If only to undermine the leverage that the Kremlin has over Western Europe as we go into autumn and winter. Absolutely. I mean, for Norway and, uh, and Finland both, I mean, the bulk of their foreign policy attention is on Russia as this enormous country that sits right next to them and also has become belligerent to the point where Finland and Sweden have decided to join NATO and give up their neutrality because of what's happened in Ukraine. But from the gas business, I mean, this is all a business. And what we're talking about here is market share is the key with the energy business, because if you have hydrocarbons, then you want to dig them out of the ground and transport them to a customer. And that's incredibly expensive. And so the key to this business is getting market share and locking people in with long term contracts. And then you keep it forever. Um, and the game here is that effectively Putin has given up his European franchise for the gas business. It's quite clear that, that Russia is going to be pushed out. And that's an enormous chunk of business. So Russia exports something like 155 billion cubic meters, whereas Norway uh, exports something like 120 billion cubic meters. And so suddenly this giant market share is up for grabs and Norway is in a position to step in and grab some of it. Having said that, this discussion, the amount of gas that's free for Norway to export is limited. Um, it's increased production this year by 8%, which is an enormous feat in order to help its European friends. But at, all said and done, there's no way that Norway can replace Russian gas. And that's the problem that Europe is facing, is that if Russians turn off the gas over the winter, there's no way of getting any more, uh, or at least enough. You can import some through LNG, liquid nat natural gas by ship, but that only accounts for 15% uh, of Europe's consumption. Um, so Norway can do its part, um, but it's only going to be part of the solution. We've got to find better solutions. And really, that means doing some sort of deal with Russia to continue the gas for another year or two while we find uh, longer term solutions through re renewables or whatever it would be. Charles McAllister, let's come to you. You're from UK onshore oil and gas. I think it's hard to underestimate, um, as Ben has said there, the lengths that Norway's gone to, from, from my information, talking to people in the Norwegian energy industry, they, they're actually curtailing their oil production in order to put more focus on gas production, because that's yeah. where the pinch really is for Western Europe. That's not a neutral exercise. That's clearly something designed to help the West uh, resist Russian energy leverage, if you like, during this ongoing conflict with Ukraine. To what extent do you think Norway can produce more to try and prove, to try and be a long term replacement for a big chunk of that Russian gas that we've got so used to over many, many decades, going back to the days of the Soviet Union? Yeah, absolutely. So it's a really good question. I mean, as the Norwegians have said, they are at max output at present. Drilling wells offshore does take a reasonable amount of time. So their ability to replace, as has been correctly said, the huge market share that Russia had quickly is going to be 
difficult now on show or we could deliver more wells quickly which we think we by shale is of great uh, merit in the uk but this proposal liam i i do find i it raises more uh more questions to me that norway um should sell gas at a contracted pr price than it does answers you know we're, we're in this position because Europe and the UK civil service, if I'm honest, assumed there would be this abundant abundance of cheap wholesale gas on the market for decades, and that has been proven totally wrong. But my questions would be, you know, how long would this long term contract be for? Um, where will those cost savings, where would this cheap gas go? Because it's 25% of supply, as you said, is that going to go to industry to reduce their prices? Is that going to go to households? You know, who's going to be the loser here? And it doesn't change the underlying market conditions. We are in a deficit scenario, okay? And that still means we are going to be having to send up a high price in order to attract LNG tankers from all around the world in order to meet our gas needs. Unless, obviously, we start fracking in the UK. <laughs> it always goes back to fracking in the UK for Charles. Well done, well done. You're earning your money today. Paul, let's talk to you. Um, it strikes me there are many, many problems with this proposal, though I have heard it from a couple of senior people within the energy industry and indeed at least one senior diplomat here in the UK. Because as Charles and Ben and, and Natasha have explained, that there, there's a kind of supply problem here. You know, we are facing a situation in the Western world, in the UK, where we could have power outages uh, this autumn and winter. The government's acknowledged that. But even if the, if the problem isn't... Well, a problem is that the gas is very, very expensive, a problem for lots of GB News viewers and lots of GB News business owners and no price cap for business owners. But the bigger problem is just there isn't enough gas. Yeah. I mean, I think Charles summed up a lot of the points that, 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 that I think are the relevant ones to all of this discussion, is the fact that even a price cap of Nor Norway uh, agreeing to longer-term contracts at lower prices doesn't, imp doesn't help the supply side of the equation. I think also it may store up quite often interference with market forces can store up problems further down the line. You could find that if the gas price, for whatever reason, did come back in years to come and some countries were stuck with contracts at higher prices than the market than the current market prices. That cause, could cause its own problems. Mm. So I think it's it's a difficult... I, the important thing, I think, is everybody's looking at different solutions. What mm. is a solution and not ruling anything out and happy to discuss ideas. But I think this idea of trying to... Contracts at lower prices could cause as many problems as it solves and certainly wouldn't, supply, to, wouldn't help the supply side of the equation. And indeed, I know from my own time in the asset management industry that Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, one of the world's yeah. biggest investors, you know, the, the Norwegian population is very jealously guards what's in that sovereign wealth fund, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, uh, and also, that sovereign wealth fund, I've seen reports it's lost a lot of money in recent months from tech investments and so on. So this is clearly a very problematic proposal, but we will continue to discuss it after the break. This is On The Money With Me, Liam Halligan. Could Norway help solve Europe's energy crisis by selling us gas on the cheap? That's what we'll be discussing also. It's not just rail workers who are striking. Dockers at the port of Felixstowe are following suit with industrial action planned for Sunday. We'll be reporting from one of Britain's most important ports. Stay with us. You're on the money. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7pm for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panellists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. 
At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back. It's 1.23. You're on the money with me, Liam Halligan. We're discussing the upcoming rise, the expected rise in European wholesale gas prices this autumn. Uh, the mighty Russian gas exporter Gazprom is warning that prices could go up from 60% by 60% from where they currently are. And that is not an idle threat, given that Russia supplies Europe still with a third of its gas, despite those, uh, that economic conflict between Russia and the West off the back of the war in Ukraine. I'm still my expert panel. We're thinking about the idea that Norway, which has replaced quite a lot of that Russian gas, could sell gas to the Western European countries at a below market price to help them out. Natasha Fielding of Argos Media, we talked about that before the break. You don't think that's possible. It's a very problematic idea. But in the absence of that, where could European gas prices go, do you think, this autumn and winter. Is Gazprom exaggerating, scaremongering when it says we could be see another 60% rise? Um, I think there's really no telling how high gas prices could go if, um, if it turns out to be a cold winter or if there are some unplanned um, outages um, at production sites. Um, Europe at the moment is kind of banking on it being a mild winter, which would mean there's not much heating demand um, from households. And so there wouldn't have to be a big cut in demand from industry. Um, if it turns out to be cold in, in Europe and possibly um, Asia at the same time, which um, competes with Europe for um, liquefied natural gas cargoes, then European gas prices could certainly spike far above um, the levels that we've seen so far. Ben Aris, you're based in Berlin a lot of the time. What's your sense of how this could play out across the European Union? Of course, of course the UK, where you're originally from, you know it very well. We're at the end of that European gas complex, aren't we? There's concern that those vital interconnectors um, supplying electricity uh, from France and the Netherlands to the UK could be switched off because it, when it comes to it, if there are outages across Europe and potentially in the UK, in terms of countries, it will be everyone for themselves, right? Indeed. Look, and I, I think we should step back a little bit here and admit to what's actually going on in so much as we are now in an economic war with Russia that following the invasion of Ukraine, the EU and Washington responded with the most extreme sanctions that it could think of. It seized $300 billion of uh, central banks' money, um, banned Russian banks from the SWIFT system, etc. And what we're seeing here now is a retaliation that um, we the, the sanctions we imposed were specifically designed to denigrate the Russian economy. And what we're doing, what we're in now, is that Putin's hitting back and using the economic tools he has in order to strike back and energy and gas in particular, but not just metals, grain, we've also seen go to all time highs. And Putin's put himself in a position where he can turn this up and down by turning up and down the gas deliveries. In June, they already reduced it to 40% through the Nord Stream 1, which goes to Germany, which is the most important note where it arrives. And then again in July, there was a technical problem and the supplies went down again, and so now Nord Stream 1 is only operating at 20% capacity. And what everyone's afraid of, and what's causing the panic, 
is that Russia will turn the gas off completely. At the moment, the gas storage tanks are doing very well. They're ahead of schedule. They were 75% full as of yesterday. And the goal is to get to 80% by uh, the 1st of October. However, Europe's gas storage tanks are so small that nobody except Austria has tanks big enough to get through the whole winter if they're full at the start of the winter in November. And the threat of Putin turning off the gas remains throughout the whole winter, and he can do that at a drop of a hat. And I think a key date to watch is December 5th, when the EU is planning to ban imports of Russian oil completely. And I could easily see the Kremlin retaliating by saying, fine, you're not going to buy our oil, we're not going to sell you any more gas. And then you plunge the whole of the continent into a huge gas crisis, where there's simply not enough. You you have to ask people uh, to turn their thermostats down. You have to tell factories to work at half capacity uh, all of the winter until the end of March when the heating season's over again. And that's a nightmare scenario for Europe because it's already going to cost $200 billion in economic damage from the crisis we currently experience. And if they turn off the gas completely, it's going to be far worse. And then we have to go into a war mentality and admit this economic war is real and impacting us directly. And that means government subsidies, that means rationing, that means legislation in order to hand out the gas, what there is to hospitals, schools, uh, social, residential, um, key industries like food production and what have you. So this is very, very serious. And I think it's only starting to dawn on people how serious it could get. Charles McAllister, you are very much a man of the oil and gas industry here in the UK. Uh, in my experience, uh, I've known Ben Aris for a lot of years. He generally knows what he's talking about. What do you think of what he just said? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would totally agree. I think the risk has never been higher. The risk of supply loss has never been higher. We are not looking at a black swan event here. There is a positively a flock of them flying by. You know, we've got a high price environment, reduction of supply from Russia, a tight LNG market, reductions in imports of electricity from Norway, France. I mean, it, it reveals the geopolitical, economic and environmental risks of over-reliance on energy imports, in my view. Paul, let's give the final word to you. What are the impl economic implications of what you've just been hearing? We heard there from an, an energy markets expert, from a geopolitical expert and a died-in-the-wall oil and gas man. They pretty much agree there could be no end to this price spike, said Natasha Fielding of Argos Media. What would that do to the cost of living crisis? What would it do to financial markets? Well, it, what, it'll do to the, well what it'll do to the economy is obviously weaken it. Um, higher prices affect consumer spending. Obviously, in industry itself, if it can't power, it can't afford to power up its its factories and may no, have to no let price people... cap for industry, as no we always say. Cap. I mean, they've seen whether you're running a pub or a steelworks. Absolutely. There's no price cap on your Absolutely. energy. Absolutely, and this is the problem. So it could have quite severe economic impacts. And I think Ben summed up some of them quite well when when he was speaking a couple of minutes ago. So yes, the implications for the broader economy could be very uh, could be quite significant. Significant unless uh, you know, unless we find a way to, to 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 sort this out. And briefly, obviously, here on the money, we're overwhelmingly focused on the, how the cost of living crisis impacts you know ordinary households and small and medium-sized businesses. But what about financial markets too? Well, obviously, financial markets are geared to the strength or otherwise of the of the economy, either a global economy, its domestic economy, and if if there is a weakening of uh, the economic outlook, that won't be good for financial assets. I think this is really concerning. We began this discussion, I was waving a Norwegian flag around, you know, it's Friday, a little bit flippant. This is an idea I heard from diplomats and energy industry insiders, as, as I said, so I've explored it. But this has turned into a really serious discussion and a very, very important discussion. Paul Sedgwick, you're going to stay with us. But thanks to my expert panel, Natasha Fielding of Argos Media, Ben Aris of BNE Intellinews, Charles McAllister of UK Onshore Oil and Gas. Thank you all for your time. This is On The Money with me, Liam Halligan. Coming up, commuters in the capital are suffering with mass worker walkouts across the tube and overground services. That follows a day of disrupted rail services. It's definitely time to consider getting a bike or some roller skates. But first, it's the GB News headlines with Bethany Elsie.
Liam, thank you. Good afternoon. It's 1.32. I am Bethany Elsie in the GB Newsroom. NHS leaders are warning the UK faces a humanitarian crisis this winter unless further action is taken to tackle rising energy bills. In a letter to the government, the NHS Confederation says surging costs mean people can't afford to heat their homes, potentially leading to an increase in annual deaths and creating further pressure on the health service. The government has already promised £400 of support for millions of households. More travel disruption today as Transport for London workers strike in a long-running dispute over jobs and pensions. Commuters are being advised to avoid the tube, which will have little or no services running. Most buses across West and South West London are also cancelled. A 44-year-old man has appeared at Wilsdon Magistrates Court charged with the murder of 87-year-old Thomas O'Halloran. Lee Byer is accused of stabbing Mr O'Halloran to death while he was riding his mobility scooter in the town of Greenford on Tuesday. Mr Byer was remanded in custody and will appear at the Old Bailey later this month. A man who killed his wife on their wedding night and put her body in a suitcase has been given a life sentence with a minimum term of 21 years. Thomas Nutt killed his partner, Dawn Walker, and dumped the suitcase in bushes behind their home near Halifax in West Yorkshire last year. Miss Walker's body was found four days later. And COVID-19 infections in the UK have fallen to their lowest level for two months. The ONS says 1.7 million people had the virus in the first week of August, a 34% drop from the last week of July. The number of patients in hospital with COVID is also continuing to drop, but experts warn figures could rise again in the autumn and winter months. You're watching GB News on TV, online and DAB Plus Radio. We'll get back to Liam and On The Money in just a moment. Direct Bullion sponsors the Finance Report on GB News for gold and silver investment. But first, here's a quick snapshot of today's markets. The pound will buy you $1.184 and €1.178. And the price of gold currently stands at £1,478.98 per ounce. Direct Bullion sponsors the Finance Report on GB News for real-time investment. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News.
Welcome back. You're on the money. It's 1.37. Now, yesterday, hundreds of thousands of pupils received their A-level results, but some didn't quite get the hat-throwing grades they were hoping for, with the biggest fall in the share of top grades awarded A and A star on record. And competition this year is fierce, pre pre predominantly for the prestigious Russell Group of universities and foreign students, which typically pay two or three times more fees. Some say that they're being favoured giving the soaring number of students from overseas. But given student debt, rising living costs and more and more apprenticeships becoming available, is university financially worth it anyway? Let's continue the discussion that we had yesterday when results came out. I'm joined now by Lucinda Dodd, a student at Nottingham University. She's editor-in-chief of Impact, their student newspaper and magazine. Lucinda, great to have you with us. You're at a fabulous university, a Russell Group University in a really interesting town. You've got Nottingham Trent University there too. Lots and lots of students there in the East Midlands. What would you say to somebody watching On The Money, listening to On The Money or their parents? They've just got their A-level results. They can't quite decide if they want to go to university. Is it financially worth it? Well, Liam, I would definitely say it is. University can't and shouldn't be put down to um, you get a series of grades and then at the end you get a piece of paper and that's how much your university experience was worth. Um, it's about like the experiences both in and outside of the classroom. So whilst I know that with the rising cost of living, um, it is a genuine factor for many people to consider whether it's economically worth going to university, but I would say that the experiences it affords you, it's definitely still worth it. Can I ask, what are you studying, Lucinda? What's your degree? I study liberal arts. So you study a degree, I mean, for some degrees, there really is a huge graduate premium, isn't there? If you study engineering, if you study economics and business, if you study maths, we know that those graduates have big earning potential almost as soon as they leave university. It's less clear for people doing history, English, liberal arts, maybe languages with all respect. But there is still a graduate premium, isn't there? There's that on average, you are likely to earn quite a lot more money uh, than people without a degree. I looked at some numbers yesterday. The average wage in the UK is something like £27,000, £28,000 a year. The average wage for a graduate is more like £40,000 a year, which is, really adds up over a lifetime. Yeah, so um, I think you've got to look at university as a sort of long-term investment. And um, yeah, whilst you could perhaps walk into a job and start earning, whereas obviously university is more of a burden financially, um, long term, it can be a great investment. And I think there is a kind of misconception that those arts degrees aren't really worth the money. But I think the skills you get from them, employers do know that they are valuable. And long term, you could end up financially better off having done a degree. How do you feel, Lucinda? I mean, I feel guilty here. I went to university back in the day where there were no fees uh, and I even got a grant for some of my uh, living costs, the means-tested grant. How do you feel that you've got, you will leave university, with all respect, with a pretty hefty debt and if you earn over a certain amount of money, not a particularly large amount of money, every week, every month out of your paycheck, along with rent and, you know, savings and food and and everything else, the government's going to take some money to pay back that debt. I mean, of course, it's not ideal. And obviously, <laughs> I am very envious of um, everyone who doesn't have to take, went to university without having to front the cost. Um, but yeah, it was something I considered when I um, first decided to go to university. And I think ultimately, you know, as you mentioned, you don't start paying it off till you've earned a certain amount and it's only a certain amount you will pay off and it is eventually scrapped if you haven't paid it all off by a certain amount of years. So, um, yeah, it didn't put me off and I wouldn't um, advise students being put off by that. Um, obviously, student debt is quite different to normal debt. Lucinda Dodd, you are Editor-in-Chief of Impact at Nottingham University. Thanks a lot for appearing here on The Money. Paul, let's... I think you, you had your daughter who's at Nottingham I University, just, right? Uh, yeah, my daughter's just literally graduated. Fabulous. From politics and international I relations. I mean, th there's a really 
confident young woman. Absolutely. She's clearly at the top of her game. Exactly. She's editing Absolutely. the student newspaper. She comes on national television yeah. at the drop of a hat. Very, very impressive young person. But it isn't for everyone, is it? Did, were you ever in two minds, you and your family, well, was... about whether or not university... I didn't go to university. Yeah. I left school and went... I did actually try and have a brief period of time as a professional cricketer, which didn't work out very well for me. But I went into the city pretty much from 18, 19 years of age. Yeah. And worked my way up through it. And for me, getting into the working environment, I really enjoyed. And I'm not sure whether I would have... I was not very academically focused, we yeah. put it that way. But you're I clearly think. a very smart guy. You're, you're a successful um, financial analyst in, in the City of London. Is there still a route into the City of London, into finance, for kids who are sharp? They're not academic, but they're savvy. They're streetwise. They can see round corners. They know how to read people. Is that route still there? It's or a lot harder. It's a lot harder. I mean, look, I've been... To interviewing graduates for many, many years in roles in the city, and they all come out of some pretty good universities. And mm. I think you've got to think about a university degree as an investment, as mm. Lucinda was saying, and mm. you want to return on that. Like all investments, you want to return on that investment. Mm. And I think for a lot of people, you know, that three years there at a university, at a good university, gives you a lot of life skills mm. and, and a qualification at the end of it that, that can help build you getting a career in the future. So it's, it's, it's an interesting debate, though. So the message today is that university is worth it financially. On yesterday's On The Money, if you were watching or listening, we heard from uh, Gareth, who uh, is an apprenticeship expert. He, uh, expert. He, he knows all about engineering apprenticeships. That's worth having a look at on the GB News app. We also heard from... Uh, Birkbeck College London, which is a university that's specifically geared up to do evening classes so you can work and do a degree at the same time or you can do a degree in later life. So there are many, many options. And once again, as I said yesterday, if you did get your A-levels yesterday, you didn't make your grades, things happen for a reason, keep your confidence, keep your chin up, you will make your way. Now, travel chaos rumbles on as some 10,000 members of the RMT union stage a 24-hour walkout, causing major disruption for commuters as strike action affects the Tube, the London Overground and some bus lines in the capital. Following ongoing disputes over jobs and pensions, this one's definitely making an impact. A whopping 3 million Londoners rely on public transport each day. And yesterday, of course, over 40,000 rail workers walked out impacting around 80% of regular national rail services. Well, I'm joined now by GB News reporter Ellie Costello. Ellie, yesterday you joined us here on The Money in a flashy sports car. Not today. I know how times have changed. I had to drive my own car in today because there was no tube uh, to get me here. And it took an awfully long time as well because the roads are jam-packed. And that is because, Liam, of course, uh, we're seeing a triple strike action in London today. We had that national rail strike yesterday. We've got another one of those tomorrow. Just one in every five services running. And today is the turn of London. And we've got a tube strike. We have an overground strike, an overground rail strike uh, and also a bus strike in south and west London as well. So there's an awful lot uh, to contend with today. And those are two separate strikes that are taking place over pay and conditions. And you might be able to see behind me, I think it's on this side, uh, this side, I've got that wrong, uh, this side uh, outside uh, Victoria Station. There is a really large crowd of people outside the station. That's because the tube entrance is shut, the railings are across it, and it's going to remain that way for the next 24 hours hours and many tourists are coming off the Gatwick Express and various other trains. They can't get anywhere. They're queuing up for taxis outside the station. I spoke to a lady earlier who'd been there for 50 minutes waiting for a taxi. Very, very uh, frustrated that she couldn't get anywhere. And this is all because 10,000 tube workers are estimated to have walked out today. 400 overground uh, rail workers have also walked out. This is the strike action over pay and conditions. It's actually the fifth time that RMT members have walked out uh, that belong to the London Underground Service uh, in a dispute over job cuts. And and speaking this morning, it was the RMT General Secretary, uh, Mick Lynch, and he claimed that these talks had come to a stalemate between TfL and the government. He says the unions are not even allowed 
at that table. Well, in response, the London Mayor Sadiq Khan, he says he wants this dispute to be resolved amicably with the unions, but he says it's the government that are using this as an opportunity to provoke the trade unions. He says he thinks we're all falling into the government's trap. Well, the Transport Minister, Grant Schatz, was speaking to GB News this morning, and he said that the rail companies have made a very fair offer. Well, there is, as I mentioned, Liam, a separate bus strike going on in London today. That's affecting 63 routes in the south and the west of the city. Uh, 1,600 bus drivers are striking. Uh, they're saying that their pay rise is not enough. It's not in line uh, with inflation. So if you're in the south or the west of London, you currently have little to no tube service, no overground service, and barely any bus service either. Uh, so the advice today, Liam, is if you are traveling in and around London, you have to to travel, then do leave lots of spare time uh, and do check before you travel. Ellie, great to have you with us. Thanks for battling your way into work to be with us here on The Money. GB News reporter Ellie Costello there. Paul, um, you also had to battle your way into the studio. <laughs> you, you got to Waterloo in South London and you yeah. walked across you know, three, three miles across London to Paddington. Just to, to be here. That's very kind of you. That's very kind of you. But the timing of this, just as the economy is trying to get... You know, yeah. I actually think, you know, Ellie talked about massive traffic. Obviously, the, the, it's almost impossible to get a taxi unless you're very lucky in central London at the moment. But, you know, it is still kind of the silly season. It's still mid-August. Not, you know, kids aren't at school. There's less people trying to get around than there normally would be. Quite a few lucky people are still on holiday. If this happens again in the autumn when we're... The economy is sort of teetering on the brink of a recession. Right. This is going to do serious damage. Yeah, right? absolutely. I mean, as you, you've been you've been talking a lot about the cost of living crisis, and people need to get to work. They need to be able to do their jobs. Industry needs to be able to work efficiently, and this doesn't help at this time. It definitely puts a serious. It can have serious implications for the economy on top of everything else that we're going through at the moment. We're just about old enough, Paul, just about to remember the 70s. <laughs> no, I'm older than you. <laughs> um, a time of, you know, huge industrial yeah. action. It could happen again this autumn and winter. We've got millions of public sector workers um, uh, saying that they're going to strike, you know, on top of these transport strikes that we've seen. You know, potentially teachers, doctors threatening to strike, nurses threatening to strike, once again, overpay. And, of course, in the public sector, you know, trade union membership still up above 50%. Yeah. So this really could be a major, major problem this autumn. Well, right? I mean, if you remember back to the 70s, I mean, I was, I was at school, but one does remember the economic impact. The three-day week and... All this sort of thing. I just started to go to work when the three-day week was going on and, and all of these sort of things. So, yes, it, it does have a material impact on the economy. And, and obviously, it could uh, higher wages. Obviously, pushes into higher prices, and of course, that could push into higher interest rates. So, it's there are a lot of implications for what's going on at the moment in the economy, and it's an, it is an uncertain time for many reasons. Worth recalling that the three-day week back then was because the coal miners were striking, That's and right, so much yeah. of our electricity was from coal-fired power right. stations. We could get outages again this autumn, couldn't we? we but could. for, obviously not because of a lack of coal, because of a lack of imported gas and a lack of gas storage. Are you now seeing financial analysts starting to price in this kind of nightmare scenario? No, I don't think we are, actually. Mm. I think that actually... Uh, Fingers still crossed. Analysts, financial analysts, I always think, are usually behind the curve. Markets get there a lot faster yeah, than, yeah. than the financial analysts do. They, they react much quicker. Yeah. They, they take a, sometimes they take a view, will act now and ask questions later. Yeah. They tend to... Ready, fire, aim, as it goes. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. And you, you quite often see that stock markets level out. Actually, when economic recessions are confirmed, I mean, the stock market levelled out in 2008, 2009. Yeah. When, when it felt really, really bad, and then yeah. markets start to think, well, actually, the news can start to improve a little yeah. bit here, get better. So financial analysts are usually, in my view, behind the curve a little bit. And, and at the moment, I mean, stock markets have held out pretty well. You've seen quite a recovery yeah. in the US. The FTSE's around 7,500. It's not far off its um, highs, historic highs. So actually, financial markets are being relatively optimistic mm. at the moment and re relatively resilient. Paul Sedgwick, we're, again, we're grateful to you for battling your way here to the Thanks. On The Money studio. Great to have you with us on the show today. Thanks, Liam. Paul Sedgwick there of Frank Investments. And it's not just rail, tube and bus workers causing widespread disruption. Dockers at Felixstowe Port are preparing to strike for eight days from Sunday over 
You've guessed it, disputes about pay. And as one of the UK's largest shipping ports, this, will do, this stoppage will do nothing to ease the supply chain shortages that are impacting a whole host of our industries. Well, GB News East of England reporter Ed Crawford has been to Felixstowe to take a look. The stormy waters along Suffolk's coastline. Felixstowe is the UK's largest container shipping port and its workers aren't happy. In a dispute over pay, the Dockers branch of the Unite Union voted 92% in favour of strike action and since then negotiations have been ongoing. CK Hutchinson Holdings are the owners of the port and they have tried to appease the unions by offering a 7% pay increase. This offer was rejected by the unions who said it was below the 11.8% retail price index rate of inflation and therefore not a solution to the problems. Since then an additional offer was put to the unions which was again rejected. The Port of Felixstowe issued the following statement. The Port very much regrets that Unite the Union has walked away from negotiations and announced strike action from the 21st to the 29th of August. We believe the offer made to the unions of 7% on all pay plus £500 lump sum was very fair in the prevailing economic climate. But the union has refused to put this to its members who are the people that stand to lose most from this industrial action. The strike has the potential to create large delays in goods reaching the shelves and add more backlog and disruption to an already stretched global supply chain. For now, it seems the negotiations have faltered and strike action is likely to take place on Sunday the 21st. These strikes will continue for eight days and they are likely to send shockwaves across the country. Ed, Ed Crawford there reporting for GB News from the port of Felixstowe where there is industrial action, strike action, from Sunday for eight days. Now, some of your emails, lots of you got in contact about the idea that Norway may be able to sell gas cheaply to Western Europe to try and ease pressure and reduce Russia's leverage over the West. Constantine says, why should Norway sell to France and Germany so they can be sued later by the EU? by the EU for contributing to climate change through sales of oil and gas on an even higher scale. But Veronica says Europe needs to pull together on this. People will be singing a different song in winter when the lights go out. All options should be on the table, though, including fracking. And Andy adds, we got ourselves into this mess by having a stupid energy policy, so it's up to us to get ourselves out. Investment in offshore oil and gas is sorely needed. These environmentalists who led us here should be made to pay the higher costs. Keep your emails coming. Tell me what you want to be discussed here on The Money. That's all we've got time for today. Thanks for joining me today and this week. Join me on Monday at 1pm where I'll be continuing to focus on the cost of living crisis and helping you to beat the squeeze. But for now, have a great weekend. This is GB News. I'm Liam Halligan and that was On The Money. Hi there. A bright day for many, sunny spells expected, especially in the south, but there will be showers and a keen breeze, especially in the north. And that's because an area of low pressure is slow moving near Iceland and uh, tightly packed isobars to the south of that low is bringing, well, fairly breezy conditions to the northern half of the UK, quite a number of showers. There were some showers earlier in the day across the rest of England and Wales. They're now moving and clearing the far southeast by shortly after 1 or 2 p.m. Once they clear, it will be a bright afternoon for much of England and Wales, some sunshine. One or two showers for North Wales, North West England, but the bulk of the showers, along with a keen breeze, will be for Scotland and Northern Ireland. Temperatures not straying far from average, low 20s for many, 24 or 25 Celsius in the southeast. Many showers disappear in the evening, with clear spells breaking out fairly widely for a time before the cloud thickens, outbreaks of heavy and blustery rain come into the west of Scotland and Northern Ireland, a strengthening breeze. 11 to 12 Celsius for much of Scotland and Northern Ireland. Mid-teens more likely for parts of England and Wales, although in some sheltered spots a fresh start to Saturday. A bright start for the Midlands, East Anglia and the South East. We keep these sunny spells here into the afternoon. Otherwise a lot of cloud and heavy rain moving through Scotland and Northern Ireland, pushing into parts of Northern England, turning more showery. And it's a breezy day for many that uh, wind gusty around the showers that will be coming through across northern parts of the UK and one or two showers will pop up further south as well. But these will be few and far between. The heaviest downpours will be associated with a line of rain pushing into North Wales and northern England as well as the North Midlands by evening. 
Scattered showers again on Sunday with more prolonged rain coming through later. Another showery day on Monday. There's just two weeks left of voting in the battle to become Britain's next Prime Minister. Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak have been dashing around the country. And tonight, they make their pitches to Conservative voters in the heart of Labour-run Manchester. But do either of them have what it takes to defend and maintain Boris Johnson's mighty majority? GB News is proud to be hosting the Conservative hustings in Manchester live and exclusive from 7pm. GB News, the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. One, two, three. Hello and welcome to We Need to Talk About on GB News with me, Alex Phillips, where we get stuck into the issues that need looking at in depth. Nothing is off the table and no one will be cancelled for saying what they think. Keeping me company today is former Brexit Party 